speak about passion and speak about Shakespeare, passion and Shakespeare. And all I found in Shakespeare in the way of passion is, of course, as usual, mimetic desire, mimetic rivalry, all sorts of mimetic things. And this finding is legitimately questioned because there is one play in Shakespeare that seems to celebrate what Shakespeare and the Elizabethan period in English called true love, you know. And true love is a technical term in uh, Shakespeare's English, probably many other folks of the same period, which means spontaneous love, you know, which means the opposite of mimetic design. Most heroes in Shakespeare talk about true love as being their love, but it's not true. But in Romeo and Juliet, you can make a special case for the truth of the love of these two. And uh, you can make a special case because it begins with a prologue, which says more or less nothing else. That is, two children love them, each other innocently, and that they are really the victims of the blood feud of their parents. It sounds a little bit like the modern slogan, make love, not war, you know? <laughs> And uh, Shakespeare knew all the tricks at the end of the 16th century. Uh, he knew them very well and he used them perfectly. Then at the end of the play, you have the, the, the Duke. The Duke who, in a way, repeats the same thing and tells us that uh, Romeo and Juliet are the victims of the world around them, of the city of Verona, of the old people who make war, and he calls them poor sacrifices of our enemy. Therefore, they are portrayed as innocent victims of a blood feud with which they have absolutely nothing to do. They are the very antithesis of it. I don't think it's true. <laughs> I don't think it's true. I think Romeo and Juliet is as uh, tricky, as different from what it seems to be, as all the comedies of Shakespeare of the same period. But anyway, it's the archetypal case for the trickiness of Shakespeare, of Shakespeare not doing what he really seems to do. And recently, as a matter of fact, I found my own thesis in a French book published by Marie-Louise Martinez, in a book by Professor Olivier Morel, called, uh, in a book called Essai Mimétique. And the essay on Romeo and Juliet says that uh, the contents of the play perpetually contradict the beginning and the end, which proclaim the truth. It's not that the truth. The, the love of the lovers is not true. It's that it is true in a way, but through tricks which have nothing to do with the essential quality of the lover and with what they are. The contents of the play contradict constantly this prologue and this epilogue I've been talking about. Take Romeo, for instance. Romeo? At the beginning, he's in love with a girl named Rosalie. And he uses exactly the same rhetoric with Rosalie as he does with everybody else. Juliet, I would, uh, Juliet, when Juliet is kissed for the first time by Romeo, she has a sentence in three words which is absolutely essential to the whole She says, you kiss by the book. And you kiss by the book means she doesn't say this in a critical way. She doesn't accuse Romeo of being too bookish and not spontaneous in her love. She's ecstatic about it. She wants people to be that way. When her mother tries to persuade her to marry Count Paris, she goes into an elaborate poem which obviously has been written before by someone else, which is a comparison of Count Paris with a book. 
which is exactly the style of uh, Juliet. And uh, she's doing that, of course, because Juliet is accessible only to that type of uh, poetry. If you look at uh, the play as a whole, you will see that constantly things happen which contradict the main discourse of the play. And uh, especially about the conclusion. There is one thing Monsieur Morel didn't see, and I'm going to say more, and I'm not going to repeat much of what he says in his article, because it would be repetitious. But uh, the conclusion of Romeo and Juliet is very strange, as you know, you know. But usually it comes at the end of an extremely dramatic play. And you have the two lovers who commit suicide, one after the other. Neither suicide is really just justified. Juliet is in her tomb, but she's been put asleep by Brother Lawrence. And she's just not awake. And of course, Romeo immediately thinks she's dead. And he kills himself on the spot. And two seconds later, Juliet wakes up, and seeing that Romeo is dead, she kills herself on the spot. Now, you would say it's difficult to prove that Shakespeare himself makes fun of that conclusion and finds it ridiculous. But even the very moderate critics of Shakespeare are fully aware that the play that follows immediately Romeo and Juliet, which is called A Midsummer Night's Dream, contains a play within the play at the end, which is an old Greek story performed ridiculously by the craftsmen of Athens. It's called Pyramus and Thisbe. Pyramus and Thisbe is the story of Romeo and Juliet. There are some lines of Romeo and Juliet which appear in the play within the play. The name of Thisbe appears in Romeo and Juliet, but I just summarized the story very briefly. Romeo and uh, Pyramus and Thisbe are supposed to be separated by their parents. And they see each other through a little chink in the wall which plays a role at the, at the beginning. In reality, they can see each other whenever they want, and they give them each other a rendezvous in some dark forest. And when Pyramus gets there, he doesn't see this, but he sees a lion which is chewing in his bloody mouth the scar of his beloved. And immediately, of course, thinking that this being is dead, he draws a sword and kills himself on the spot. And three seconds later, this baby shows up. She hasn't been eaten at all. And seeing that Pyramus is dead, she grabs his sword and kills herself on the spot. The whole thing is performed ridiculously and is nothing but a comedy in a Midsummer Night's Dream, which is obviously making fun of the conclusion of Romeo and Juliet. Shakespeare, when he wrote this play, did not realize he was going to be Shakespeare. And he was going to be regarded by the 19th and the 20th century as a prophet, as a guru, as a man who should give, uh, explain what our way of life should be in each play. He just had fun. He wanted to write funny plays. And I'm pretty sure that there were, to him, as to modern movie makers, two types of theater goers. There was the average theater goer who would swallow the story of Paris and this day, or the story of Romeo and Juliet whole without bothering them. And then there were the people who were his friends and who were making fun of what he was doing because probably he was talking to them ahead of time and explaining to them, you see, I'm going to use the conclusion of Pyramus and Thisbe, and they will all believe it as if it were a gospel word. You know? And he didn't realize that in the 20th century still, there would be all these Hollywood adaptations of Romeo and Juliet, which are much worse than anything done in the days of Shakespeare, and turn it into romantic trash of the worst kind without anybody even wondering if Shakespeare has really written that sort of stuff. 
They are so. The question is, the, the traditional critics, you know, of 50 years ago when I started to be interested in Shakespeare, they, they call themselves the serious critics, and God knows that they were serious. <laughs> <laughs> They were wondering about Romeo and Juliet. They said, should we count Romeo and Juliet among the real masterpieces of Shakespeare? He has so much of that rhetoric of the oxymoron. The rhetoric of the oxymoron which unites words that should not be united. I give an example from Romeo and Juliet, which is Fiend and Jericho. These serious critics were rationalists and said, if Romeo is to Juliet a fiend, he cannot be an angel. That's irrational. And if he is an angel, he cannot be a fiend. Therefore, the play cannot really be a great play, which is so full of these oxymorons. You see, the characters shouldn't speak that way, because they are in true love. They talk to each other normally. They never fool each other. They never act hypocritically with each other. They are always sincere. They are always very nice people to each other. Therefore, the problem with Romeo and Juliet, really deep down, if you look at it and you see that Shakespeare understands that, is that their love is totally undramatic. And you have to have something to make it dramatic. You know? You have to have something to make it dramatic. And the question is, what is it going to be? If you start looking at the play, you will find that curiously, in the language of the play, you find precisely what you should not find. You should find you find all these oxymorons that should not be there, you know. And uh, in particular, there is one place, one part of the play, which is especially disturbing to the serious critics, because the oxymorons are so numerous. They are piled up in such a way that it sounds like a caricature. And in my view, it is a caricature. A caricature by Shakespeare himself. And I'm going to read it to you. I'm going to read it to you. Um, and uh, I'm changing the order of my lecture there. Therefore, I'm probably going to be in trouble. But I read to you that tirade, which is the one that worries the serious critics most, you know. And you're going to see there are good reasons for that. That Shakespeare is simply going too far. He's just like a manufacturer of oxymorons that would go crazy, you know. Or it would become a compulsive thing, and he just couldn't stop. And uh, here he goes, you know. Oh, this is Julian speaking. Now, what reason could she have to talk the way she does about Romeo? Oh, serpent heart, hid with a flowery face. Did ever dragon keep so fair a cane? Beautiful tyrant, fiend angelical, dove feathered raven, wolfish raving lamb, despised substance of divinest show. Just opposite of what thou justly seems, a damned saint, an honorable villain. O oh, nature, what makes, what hast thou do to hell, in hell, where thou didst bow the spirit of a fiend in mortal paradise of such sweet flesh? Was ever book containing such vile matter so fairly bound? Oh, that deceit should dwell in such gorgeous house. And she goes on like this, continues for a while. So this disturbs greatly, you see, because they say, we lovers of this people. It's extremely artificial, and it doesn't sound like real love language between people who love each other, you see. And indeed, this is what we feel. But I think that, uh, you know, this nice professor of English who were the very serious critics didn't have the type of love life that they had at the Elizabethan court. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that the Elizabethan court, that type of language,
just as it did at the French court at the same time and so on, because the rhetoric of the oxymoron <coughs> is very abundant in Shakespearean activity, but it's also there in all English poetry, but it's also there in Italian poetry, it's there in Spanish poetry, in French poetry, and I don't know if they already wrote German poetry at that time. Yeah. At the time, but it's certainly was there. This way. And the serious critics, what do they say about that rhetoric? They say that it's false. They say that it's artificial. That it's unnatural. And we've learned that in school. So we are convinced that it is true. You know? And in a way, the literary critics had a great influence on us. And they tell us, in a way, that Shakespeare was a man who wrote naturally like that. As if you could write naturally like that. And who gradually learned to get rid of all that bad stuff, you know, that geniuses should not have, which is that rhetoric of the oxymoron. And of course, the rhetoric of the oxymoron doesn't work for the type of love Romeo and Juliet are supposed to have for one another. Because, as I said before, this love is totally undramatic. Romeo never acts hypocritically vis-a-vis -vis Juliet. Juliet does not act coy with Romeo. They are always sincere with each other. The first word they say to each other is that they are in love with each other. After that, they don't have anything else to say. <laughs> and I see that's a problem of the play. You see? But so, Finally, they use that language, and Shakespeare shows us these kids using that language the way we do. What has happened for Julian to talk this way about Romeo? Well, it's very simple. The blood feud has become more heated. Why? Because Tybalt, who is Julian's cousin, a Catholic, has killed Mercutio who is the friend of Romeo, and they are Romeo who didn't want to have anything bad happen with the Capulets, is forced to avenge his friend, is led into killing Tybalt. <coughs> so, in that tirade that I read to you, if you read it as I read it, you think that you are dealing with a girl who is very much in love with a man, and who has good reason to think that this man is not as faithful to her as he should be. That's your first inclination when you listen to this. In reality, it has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with that because between Juliet and Romeo, there is no such suspicion. It cannot exist. They trust each other implicitly all the time. They are perfect lovers. And Shakespeare has decided to create the perfect love. Once in a lifetime, in his whole career, he wants to create the perfect numbers. So how, in my view, as a poet of the 16th century, he's forced to use that language. He's forced to use that language because intense love of the kind you have in the Elizabethan play and all the comedies of Shakespeare works like the oxymoron. It's a product of mimetic this and the lovers are always rivals of each other. In other words, you always fall in love with a girl who refuses to pay the slightest attention to you. As soon as she pays attention to you, you're very happy for a few seconds, but after that you're disappointed and your love affair is really at the end. We are in a world where the erotic world is entirely predicated on its own failure, on its own constant failure and unsatisfaction, which is anyway the love of uh, the French poetry at the same time and so forth, where dissatisfaction is absolutely essential. This love is not peaceful by definition. So, in a way, Juliet, she takes advantage. This is going too far. I speak. She takes advantage of the situation, which is the murder of Tybalt, in order to say, to speak about Romeo like a lover of the kind. For the first time, she has a real opportunity to do it. 
And we can see this because Shakespeare insists, insists very strongly, awkwardly, in order it's not awkwardness, he is wanting to show to his friends what he's really doing. The friends have heard all these arts and morals. They know that Shakespeare is making fun of them, you know. But the nurse, Romeo is really talking to a nurse. Her nurse is a very simple woman. She loves Juliet, but she hates that affair with Romeo, with a Montague, with the enemy, and so forth. So she's very really happy to hear that. She thinks that Juliet has turned back into a regular Capulet. And she shouts, shame come to Romeo. You know? And immediately, Juliet jumps on her. Absolutely furious. And she reveals the truth of the tyrant that can be wrong. Look what she says. Blister be thy tongue for such a wish. Shame come to Romeo. He was not born to shame, but on his brow shame is a shame to sit, for it is a throne where honor may be crowned, sole monarch of the universal earth. Oh, what a beast was I to chide at him. You see what I mean? She contradicts completely the preceding tyrant in order to show us, to show the nurse, who is a sole audience, what she really meant. But the audience in the theater it's really like the nurse, a little bit or in between. Doesn't really know. Only the friends of Shakespeare understand the double entendre all over the place that Shakespeare is making fun. He's using the oxymoron in a way that is not permitted in order to be real love language in the Elizabethan sense. There must be violence. And the violence cannot provide, be provided by the relationship because it's not there. At one point, Juliet actually offers to Romeo to play hard to get. If you want me to play hard to get, if it could uh, inflame you further, I would do it. But she does it so innocently, so naively, that she destroys the possibility of uh, such behavior as she speaks. In other words, there can be, I repeat, absolutely no drama between Romeo and Juliet. And there cannot be no love of poetry in the Elizabethan sense. So the only way Shakespeare can do it is do it through the blood feud, sneaking away. That's why he has the prologue at the beginning which denies any relationship between Romeo and Juliet and the blood feud. He wants to implant in our mind the total separation between the two. Make love, not war. What Shakespeare really says, which is very different from our message, much more classical, much more traditional, much more ethical, deep down inside, is love in the erotic sense of the Elizabethan court. And war are much more alike than they seem to be, and than the populace believe. This is what he really says. But he says it in such a witty way that the critics have not yet really understood. Shakespeare is attracting our attention to this sneaky matter in which Juliet, or rather he, Shakespeare himself, exploits the language of the blood feud in order to make Juliet a passion, a passionate woman in the Elizabethan sense, which she should not be. The conception of love that the audience wants, perfect love, excludes the blood feud and everything that goes with it. In reality, the rhetoric of that love is nothing but a combination of words of endearment and violence, of hatred and passion. In other words, it's the way people behave in the world. It's, in a way, the complexity of human relations which are never that simple and which probably at the Elizabethan court were archetypally uh, uh, complex. If Shakespeare truly believed in the romantic myth and that represented a truly divine, which is what mediocre writers would have done, his play would have been quickly forgotten because it would have none of the content that I read 
And I'm going to show you, I showed you, I gave you a tyrant in which it does not work at all. Because Shakespeare goes too far. Shakespeare shows us that he uses the rhetoric in an excessive way. On purpose, he goes too far in order to show the experts what he's really doing. But there are other parts of the play which are very, very different, you know, which are very different and which work very well. For instance, after the first meeting, it is very important that the first meeting would take place in the Capulet's house. And Shakespeare, uh, Romeo and his friends have crashed a Capulet party. We are told that only the old people are interested in the blood field and that they are responsible for it. In reality, the blood field is Mercutio, fighting I don't remember whom. Mercutio killed by Tybalt. They are both very young people. Tybalt killed by Romeo. The old people, they seem to be mixed up in it, but in reality they are not. And in order to show us Shakespeare dares at the beginning of the play, when Romeo crashes that Capulet party, Tybalt is there. Tybalt is the meanest Capulet character. He wants to kill Romeo on the spot. And Romeo is saved by whom? By the old Capulet patriarch, who is the father of Juliet. He had a daughter very late, you know. And uh, who prevents Tybalt from killing Romeo. Therefore, if the old Capulet is responsible for the crime, it's because he's the only humane man. The young people are always fighting. But he's so humane that he saves Romeo for the later tragedy. So you can say that uh, literally he's responsible for the crime. But because he's much more humane than the young people, I'm defending the, the old people, as you see, in that way. It's very important. And the fact, you know, that, that, that there are tyrants. In, in France, they had a new. A new word, they've coined a new word recently, you know, which is, uh, there are many bad signs for the French language right now, but there is a good one. They, they, they coined a new ism, which they call jeunisme. Jeunisme from jeune, young. So it's really like youthism, the cult of youth. The youth cannot do anything wrong, they are always right, they are peaceful, loving, they are going to save the world of each generation. I've seen that happen. At least a dozen times in my life already, and it's going stronger than ever. And uh, youthism is certainly there because uh, I'm going to show you what uh, Juliet talks about the California quotes that I have there. But I uh, have oh, yeah, yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to see that there, Shakespeare exploits, you know, uh, shamelessly the but old folks, men fame as they were dead, unwieldy, slow, heavy, and pale as dead. It's beautiful. Huh? And this is just kind of a manifesto against old age by Juliet, which comes in, you know, for no reason at all, which is an appeal, I would say, to what I call the youthism of the, of the audience. Yeah. But I go back now to the main dish of my talk, which is the oxymoron, you know. And most of the time, the oxymoron is used in such a way that it sounds very good, it sounds powerful, it doesn't sound ridiculous. But as soon as you start reading the text carefully, you see that there are two meanings. And one of them is very simple, it's very literal. It simply means, most of the time, that Juliet is a Capulet, 
when that Montague is a Romeo, listen to this. After the first meeting of Romeo and Juliet at that party, I mentioned before, Juliet is alone and she thinks about her love at first sight for Romeo. And she says, my only love sprung from my only hate. Prodigious birth of love it is for me that I must love a loathing enemy. What does it mean? It means simply that Romeo is a Montague and that Juliet is a Capulet and that their two families have been at war. And of course that Juliet fell in love with him. But look at the language in three lines. Two times love and hatred are paired together. Which is the property of that rhetoric. Is it that rhetoric? Is it the direct message? It's both at the same time. Much of the play is written like this. Magnificent. And at the same time, very simple. If you, you can take it literally, you can translate it. You have to say to the students, that's all it means. She means she fell in love with the, the heir of the Montague family. But here you don't notice the oxymoron at all. Because they work. You see? So in the other time, you can be sure that Shakespeare is doing it on purpose. It's not that he, because he's too young and doesn't know how to handle that type of language, as some people believe. So I really think that Romeo and Juliet is a tremendous masterpiece. But it's not a masterpiece in our sense, because we fetishize art. We think the artist, every time he writes a play like this, should be the complete message about what he believes, about the world, about ourselves, about universal salvation, or and so forth, and we turn him into a guru or something. But Shakespeare, I said, didn't know he was Shakespeare. He was having tremendous fun, and he was a tremendous poet, and he was writing and having, doing it in a way which made it acceptable to his audience and hid from them what they didn't want to know about the fact that when they loved, they were exactly like Romeo and Juliet, but they didn't want to acknowledge it. Therefore, they had to have the myth in front of them and not the reality. But Shakespeare here can give us both the reality and the myth in the same language, which is absolutely extraordinary. But you know, the most fantastic scene, from the point of view of what I'm saying, is the balcony scene. When people think about Romeo and Juliet, they think about the balcony scene. And they think the balcony scene, you know, Romeo climbed the balcony, it's a balcony scene destroy all other balcony scenes. <laughs> well, the problem with the balcony scene is that Juliet is perfectly ready. She doesn't push back. She doesn't have, you know, the shame that a normal girl should have. Or she doesn't turn away from him at all. She greets him with open arms. Therefore, climbing the balcony and getting into Juliet's room is absolutely nothing dramatic at all. Therefore, where does the drama come from? Well, I'm going to read part of the balcony scene to you, and you're going to be very surprised because no one ever read these things, really. They talk about them. They turn them into a myth. Juliet, Romeo is climbing. If they see, if they do see thee, they will murder thee. Who is thee? Who is they? They are the mafia of the Capulet family. They are hidden in the bushes. They are ready for such a case as anyone who would climb. Juliet said they would kill 12 Romeos before breakfast without any problem. You see what I mean? So, what does Romeo answer? Alack, there lies more peril in thine eyes than 20 of their souls. Look thou but sweet, and I am proof against their enemy. So, in other words, we must believe that there is something about Juliet that makes the love difficult there, but it's not true. The only enemy are the Catholic henchmen. The only 
drama in that scene is provided by the Capulet engine. And see on your faces that I maybe I'm going to have to face a hostile bunch of people. <laughs> so Juliet continues, I would not for the world they saw the she doesn't say, move away, you bad men who are trying to get into my room. She talks about the soldiers and her parents. And Romeo gets, I have nice cloak to hide me from their eyes. And but thou love me, let them find me here. My life were better ended by their hate than death prolonged, wanting. But Romeo is not wanting of Juliet love. She's never said anything to him, but I'm willing. You know, and she said it a dozen times, and she cannot continue saying it all the time there. So you, you have to have something else. And what can you have if not the hench of the Capulet? The whole drama is provided by the Capulet hench. As soon as you start reading, you know, the letter of you realize that Shakespeare is doing this, and he's very conscious of it. And the proof of it is that tirade of uh, Juliet. If a writer shows the truth too openly about that type of love, if he makes it too clear that he understands about human sinfulness and frailty, he will scare his audience. He will endanger the main premise of his romantic play, which is the authenticity and purity of the young lovers, the youth cult. If a writer is too open about mixing his hate with his love in the manner demanded by the mimetic principle, his work will smack too much of mimetic trickery and romantic souls will be scared away. And Shakespeare can manage a road in between there, which work practically all the time. And he can really deviate from it as much as he wants in order to show his friends that he himself is no dupe of what he's doing. And no one will see it. And probably in the first performances, there were inner friends of Shakespeare who knew to understand what I'm talking about. But today there is practically no one. Because everybody, maybe because of the lack of uh, anything else in our culture, takes that rhetoric for the real thing, which Shakespeare certainly does not. In my view, that doesn't diminish his genius, that makes his genius incomparably greater that he can at the same time display it, make us believe in it, and show us that it is not true, if we are capable enough to, and interested enough to discover what he is really talking about. So far from being different from the comedies, I feel that Romeo and Juliet in many respects is in a way the most extreme of the comedies. The one that goes as far as Shakespeare ever did in the direction of true love in the Elizabethan language, which was always there in connection with the, uh, 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 with the rhetoric. And at the same time, he defines, he gives us the meaning of that rhetoric, which is essentially a violent one where the element of hatred is always there with the love, you know. And of course, many aspects of this will reappear in other plays of Shakespeare in a much more gentle way. Think, for instance, of Much Ado About Nothing. In Much Ado About That Nothing, you have two characters who don't play a great role in the play, but who are there only for, what I would say, mimetic reason. They are Beatrice and Benedict. Beatrice and Benedict, we all know that they are in love with each other. And they are in love with each other, and they are at that Elizabethan court, and neither one wants to speak first. 
The problem of that language is that it's alternation reciprocal. If you make a confession first, you give to your partner a weapon that you don't have anymore. Therefore, Beatrice and Benedict are reduced to constant dueling. They are like these races, these bicycle races, you know, neither one must start first. Because the one who starts first is in a bad position. Because he will protect the one guy. So the main thing at the beginning is never to start. To wait as long as possible. This is what Beatrice and Benedict are doing. So each time they meet, they exchange insults. They exchange insults and they fun of each other. And, but the play is full of good angels who understand the situation perfectly and manage to inform both sides that it's pretty safe to speak, that the other side is convinced and is in love and so forth. But we need the medi mediation of outside people in order to make a harmonious contact between these uh, two people. And you have many such things. As a matter of fact, the formula, Shakespeare is so mimetic that uh, he uses parallel formulas that are definitions of mimetic desire from play to play. If you look at much ado about nothing, everything is hearsay. You overhear something about someone, then you tell someone else, and then you arrange or disarrange a love affair. And Shakespeare has the formula in the middle of it, love by hearsay which is a magnificent definition of a medic design. But in a Midsummer Night's Dream, which is a very different play, but at the same time the same play, he has the character talk and at the end say, oh, what hell it is to choose, even though they do nothing else, to choose love by another's eye. And if you look at Midsummer Night's Dream, the whole play is based on vision. Everything is Everything is seeing what you should not see and what disrupts the game. And if you look at much ado about nothing, everything is hearing, overhearing. There are always edges, trees there, and people are listening to what they should hear, and so forth. Romeo and Juliet is a play which is very similar, but at the same time is much more tricky because it calls itself and it is a tragedy. Therefore, I think Shakespeare there can be caught red-handed doing his job as a playwright, which is to create illusion. Thank you.